Cindy, should we maybe get started? Good. Well, good morning, everyone, or maybe for some of you, it might be good afternoon, but welcome uh, to day three, uh, uh, track 11. Um, for the first 25 minutes of this call, uh, we are going to be showing a presentation, um, and the topic of the discussion will be introducing DTAC, Centralized Supply Chain Support for the Indo-Pacific Region. And so I'm going to start by playing the video. Um, and uh, at the end of the video, we're going to turn it over for Q&A. OK? Yeah. Hi, my name is Emily Pirello. I'm a pharmacist and the Health Supply Chain Program Manager. I believe we've lost the sound. Technical assistance in the Indo Pacific region. This is an innovative solution to some of the common difficulties that are faced by both the people delivering TA in low to middle income countries as well as the people that we work with. So, we'll be having a look at our region known as DTAP. We're going to have a look at the problem that we were trying to address. Um, and we'll have a look at some of the challenging features of supply chain TA in the Pacific, which are applicable across um, a wide range of settings as well. We'll have a look at the solution, so what DTAC actually is um, as a centralised support platform and what uh, services and activities are provided. We'll look at the method, so what we actually did, um, what we're doing, um, and the results, of course, to see uh, the outcomes and also some of the challenges that we faced along the way. So first, what are these challenges that we're trying to address? So some of the common features of delivering TA uh, for supply chain in the Pacific um, are the following. So the first is that it's often delivered in an ad hoc manner. Um, and this often results in poor longer term uptake. Um, and that's largely due to insufficient change management. So a country will identify um, a need, for example, um, or there is um, a problem that needs to be addressed somebody gets sent in to go and deliver that TA, it's, it's solved in the short term, but there's not a long-term plan in place, or if there is, there's insufficient um, methods to, um, to result in long-term change. Secondly, the process is often very slow and cumbersome. So um, country staff might identify a need, um, but in order to get from, from that point to actually uh, receiving the assistance, there's often a lot of red tape involved. So they might need to go and write up a proposal, seek funding, um, and this can of course take a whole lot of time. So in some circumstances, that effort might be perceived to be too, too great for, for the perceived benefit and perhaps um, the assistance isn't sought at all. Or if it is, it's a really long time between having that need and having it resolved. And third, we've noticed, and I'm sure you have too, there are a lot of missed opportunities in this area. So um, there are similar problems across the Indo-Pacific region and perhaps in some other regions, um, a similar kind of issue, but we go about solving those in very siloed manners. Um, whereas we could really be learning from each of those opportunities and applying them to other contexts, um, essentially at the same time. So we thought there's got to be a way to go about this, that we can achieve good TA um, in a more efficient manner. And so our concept addressed these three key issues. So instead of ad hoc support, we wanted to have um, TA that's provided in a consistent, proactive manner with long-term follow-up. So rather than simply being a reactive um, support that's provided, we really want that proactive proactiveness um, to be at the core of, of this new um, concept. Secondly, we were looking for a way that we could deliver it um, without, without that red tape for the countries. So what we would like to see is a pool of funding that's already there to access and there's no cost to the countries. And thirdly, um, there is definitely an opportunity um, to create some regional standards um, and to really upskill our local staff and create that network of skilled professionals in the, the health supply chain area within the region. And so this is all culminated in what we're calling DTAC. So this is a new centre for health supply chain excellence across the Indo-Pacific region. 
Um, the, the long name of this is the Health and Supply Chain Data and Technical Assistance Centre, hence known as DTAC, a very long name. And so the countries that we're working in at the moment, um, or basically, so we're located in Auckland and in Melbourne, and the countries that we're supporting are the six Polynesian countries. So we've got Cook Islands, Niue, Samoa, Tonga, Tokelau, and Tuvalu. Some of the, the common challenges that are faced in health supply chain in this area of the world um, are one, the geographical isolation of the countries um, in terms of getting stock from, from international suppliers. It's, um, it's a long way away from um, most of those suppliers. Um, of course, we've got the, the geographical climate as well. So um, in terms of storage of medications and maintaining um, the cold chain, this is um, a big issue. And of course, within the countries themselves, to get from one uh, warehouse, for example, to, to a health facility, um, the health service point, it is um, you know, quite a difficult uh, task to get those items moving along. So the six Polynesian countries have been funded by uh, the New Zealand Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade through a specific project that funds DTAC. So the project uh, began in February of 2020. Um, and is going until January of 2025. So what are the specific aims of this centre that we're calling a Centre for Health Supply Chain Excellence? The first is that we want to achieve greater than 95% availability of essential medicines at the central level. We want to achieve value for money in procurement. We want to obtain a network of skilled local staff within the region. And we also want to develop these regional standards that are applied across the region and to share knowledge between countries. So in terms of the need for this, so we think, of course, this is a great idea, um, but the countries do too. So at the beginning of this project, we developed a memorandum of understanding to clearly identify what the relationship is between DTAC and each of the countries. So what we expect from one another. And we got some really exciting feedback at the beginning of this project. Um, the countries were incredibly grateful, first of all, for that, um, that pool of funding that would be available to support their supply chains, but also they all identified that it was a real need um, to, to improve and strengthen those supply chains. And also they were excited about the model of DTAC as well. So what have we been doing in each of these areas? So in terms of improving access to essential medicines, um, one of the key things that we focus on at DTAC is using digital systems to strengthen the health supply chain. So in each of these countries, we are using M-Supply, so an electronic logistics management information system. So we are hoping by the end of this project that all of the countries will have full coverage of M-Supply across all of their health facilities, um, should they wish to do that. We're providing things like refresher training, um, and activities that help to optimise the system and its benefits. So going through and tidying up the system. So we're going through and having a look at things like um, invoices that haven't been finalised that may be impacting other areas of M supply, such as suggested order quantities. Also things like categorising items so that um, reporting can be um, optimised as well. We are also uh, tracking key performance indicators for health supply chain. Um, and I'll show you an example of that shortly. We are, of course, also looking to minimise stockouts. Um, we're really trying to be proactive about this. So we've developed methods where we are looking for items that are at risk of stockout and actively notifying the countries about this to make sure that there is an order that has already been placed or, if not, um, assisting um, the procurement uh, unit to facilitate those orders. Um, we are also helping uh, to source difficult to find items, so by directly contacting suppliers um, of the region. So here's an example of something that we've developed through DTAC. So this is our report card. And so basically we've got um, some key performance indicators related to M supply. Um, we're tracking things like expiring stock and helping to show um, immediately what stock is at risk um, of expiring, um, items that are at risk of stock out and how much you should order, and items that are already out of stock and need, need in order to be placed. We've also got um, our tracking of end supply performance over time as well. So we give a score to reflect how well they're using their end supply system. We've also got a national report 
card, um, which allows you to compare the performance of various health facilities. So we can have a look at things like um, customer invoices that they've processed, um, if their, their synchronisation is working, so if the, the system is having any technical difficulties, we can identify that as well. We can also track the M supply performance over time um, for various facilities together. And you can see the red, orange, yellow and green backgrounds show you um, how well um, they are performing um, in terms of their use of M supply. Moving on to the next um, key area, which is achieving value for money in procurement, uh, we're supporting the countries with their annual tenders. Um, this includes uh, supporting stock takes, quantification and forecasting. Um, when the bids come back, we're supporting them with line by line bid, bid evaluation using M supply and also contract management where required. So we're also using um, that dashboard that I showed you to identify stock that's expiring or that's slow moving and that we can move along to other health facilities um, to reduce the amount of stock that's wasted. I want to show you also the health supply hub. This is essentially a space for suppliers to interact with the countries um, directly through a digital platform. This is still um, in development, so I'm going to share with you what are some of the key ideas of this. So first, um, the concept of a supplier uploading their item catalogues into this health supply hub. So we found during COVID, the countries were often asking us, you know, where can I get, you know, masks from? And so in this system, we could have the suppliers showing what stock they've got available, how much, how much it costs, and that really increases transparency across the board. DTAC itself, um, we envision providing benchmark prices. So a country um, could see, is this more or less what I should expect to pay for this item? The next piece of the puzzle here is um, supporting tenders. So we envision the country advertising their tender within the health supply hub to the various suppliers and the suppliers would directly participate in the tender through the health supply hub. Um, DTAC will also offer a service for conducting supplier pre-qualification and that information will be accessible to the countries. Once the tender is reviewed, the country would uh, create uh, their purchase orders within the uh, health supply hub. The supplier could then have a look at what they've been awarded and they could accept or reject it um, or, or provide feedback within that system. And then, of course, um, DTAC and staff would be supporting that bid evaluation process. And finally, the supplier would then send their goods with the dispatch advice recorded within the health supply hub. So the countries could see when the stock is on its way. The country would then receive their goods within M supply as they currently do. Uh, and DTAC would help support uh, supplier performance monitoring. Uh, the next area is supporting that network of health supply chain staff across the region. So this is at the core of DTAC. Um, it's about capacity building local staff. We have also employed a local project officer in Tonga and we'll be advertising shortly for a position in Samoa. Some of you may be aware of the new M Supply International Accreditation course that's been launched a couple of months ago now. So this is an online platform for learning how to use M Supply in a standardised way. People who sign up to do it can choose to be listed on a public register of accredited M Supply users. The idea of this is being able to really harness that uh, knowledge that's from within the region. Um, We've also been conducting webinars. Uh, we've launched a scholarship opportunity for um, some uh, emerging leaders within the region to undertake um, the health supply chain course. Um, we've awarded that to five successful applicants. So here is a quick view of the accreditation course that we've developed. Um, so you've got very clear um, competencies which are advertised on our website uh, for each of the different levels. Um, once you complete a, all the course content, you then undertake a, um, a test. Um, and once you've passed the test, uh, then um, you receive a certificate. So the course covers both uh, M Supply uh, features as well as general health supply chain management tips. 
it's it's actually had a very good uptake. Um, we've got an 88% participation rate and 86% engagement rate, 377 uh, learners. Um, they've spent a lot of time on the system and they've come from all over the world. So we're now we're up to 50 countries. And the final point on us having some standards across the region and harnessing that knowledge and sharing it first is those dash dashboard report cards. The next is some standard operating procedures for warehouses and guidelines on annual tenders and procurement. And we're also developing a supply chain key performance indicator assessment tool using the Tupaya platform, um, which is a product of Beyond Essential Systems. It will cover key performance indicators related to health supply chain that extend beyond M supply. So looking at things like whether a country has an essential medicines list, when it was last updated, et cetera. Some of the challenges that we've um, come up with in, in developing DTAC, we started in February 2020, right at the beginning of the pandemic. So when we developed this concept, obviously the pandemic hadn't begun yet. So a lot of our ideas in terms of traveling and being in country and doing new deployments have, have been quite slow to, to kick off and some of them have had to be delayed. Um, so in terms of tracking our progress in a quantitative manner, it has been quite difficult. Training that we would normally do in person has had to be done online. So we've adapted our approaches in that manner. Um, and of course, with the, the pandemic happening at the same time, there've been other competing priorities uh, within the countries themselves. So um, long-term uh, health supply chain strengthening has taken a bit of a backseat to other more uh, emergency kind of matters, um, such as managing the immediate threat of COVID and also rolling out COVID vaccine. In terms of our outcomes, I wanted to share with you a bit of feedback from some of the people that we've actually been working with. So the first one is um, from Andrew Orange uh, from the Cook Islands. My name is Andrew Orange. I'm the Chief Pharmacist with the Mudai Order the Cook Islands Ministry of Health. Working with DTAC has been hugely beneficial for us. Uh, it's helped us understand the system better, uh, to manage our stock much better, which has given us better value for money in terms of stock procurement, and been, it helped us to maintain those essential supply chains. And we'll hear now from Brenda from Samar. My name is Brenda Seppel. I'm a principal pharmacist at the Ministry of Health from Seppel Warehouse. Team support provided by DTEC has helped us with using the new MIM supply system, and all of my colleagues are confident with processing orders and doing stock take. I have noticed the improvement in our inventory management and can generate reports in a timely manner. I am keen to expand my knowledge on undertaking a course on storage and distribution of public health products. DTEC made it possible by offering me a scholarship. Titan lover so forth. So our results and what we can take away from this. So what we found is having this centralised regional support centre has been a really effective way to embed best practices and to implement change long term. We've been able to provide support in a timely manner uh, for both proactive and reactive uh, reasons. We are in the process of developing a cross-country uh, professional network um, and of course, um, it's a good way to achieve regional benefits while also maintaining sovereignty. And we see DTAC as a long-term centre for supply chain excellence that will expand to cover the entire Pacific region and hopefully be there for a long time uh, beyond our current uh, January 2025 end date. And we also hope that this serves as a model for other regions to adopt. Thank you for your time. Wonderful. Um, before we jump into, we've got about three minutes here before we jump into the next presentation, but wanted to see first and foremost, if our speaker is on the call, um, with us. Hello, Emily. Hello. Hi. Um, yeah. Good morning from Melbourne. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. We're excited to have you. Um, well, you. I think what we can do since we've got three minutes Yeah, we have questions, but we want to make sure it's not our questions. We want to open it up to the floor for anyone who has a question. Uh, to, to really, you know, obviously engage you and to really hear about all the great work you guys are doing. Uh, this is a phenomenal project and, and nonetheless, it's very, very impactful. Um, so with that, let me stop and, and see if there's any questions that uh, uh, any of you all on the call currently have.
Well, while we're waiting, I, I guess I would jump in and I'll, I'll kick us off here, Emily. Um, you know, the first thing that comes to my mind is that this is so needed uh, for, for the work you all are doing. I'm kind of thinking about the fact that you, you're kind of creating a marketplace where you're bringing efficiency to the countries who need it and the suppliers who, who have it. Talk a little bit about how the current global supply chain bo bottleneck that's been going on just across the world in general, how is that impacting the needs of, of companies, of, of countries? Uh, specifically, um, and, uh, and and is that making them really reconsider in terms of who they go with because of just the, the immediate procurement? And you know, share a little bit about that, if you may. Sure. Thanks for the question. So we definitely noticed that uh, during COVID, the situation with supplies, it was very obvious with the countries that we were working in, there was an increased need basically immediately for obviously you know PPE, but also other essential items as well. Uh, we noticed countries having more difficulties with obtaining just kind of general stock uh, of even life-saving medications. So um, in terms of deciding which supplies they went with, I mean, that was a dis decision ultimately up to them. They just wanted basically the stock to come in, no, no particular preference to, um, to suppliers, just who could provide that stock in a timely manner. And we still see that as an issue now, um, still ongoing after, you know, two years of the pandemic still having those bottlenecks uh, in the supply chain. What we've been able to do though is, is help the countries with liaising with the suppliers. So where they've had difficulty through their regular channels, we've kind of contacted the suppliers ourselves directly um, and just provided that linkage between them. We haven't, obviously we don't choose any particular suppliers. We see ourselves as kind of an objective middleman um, and just providing that link to the countries to, to allow them to obtain those essential supplies. Thank you. Sydney, do we have one more time for one more question? I think we are at time. Uh, um, so yeah. Emily, thank you so much for joining and for presenting. This was an incredible presentation and um, we are, we're excited to see how DTAC continues to develop. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. All right, folks, while I load up for the next presentation, bear with me here. And, and as Paul is loading the next presentation, um, if, if folks have questions during the presentation that they want to put in the chat, feel free to use that, that method as well as if, if you'd rather not come off mute. Okay. And I saw your note, Craig. I'll make sure to make a note of that next time. All right. Okay. Can you all see my screen here? I can see that, Paul. This is Edward. Yep. We can. All righty. Let's see if we can. Should present here. So. Okay. issues here. I think what we're going to do, we're just going to. I think you can, if you swap displays when you play from start. It should switch to the slide view. Okay. If I do here? On the top bar on the left, there should be a swap, swap displays. There we go. All righty. And is our, is there, Ed, are you on a call? No, I'm not. I'm with you. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you now. All right, so I'll be I'll be tapping through. So just let me know when you're ready. Thanks a lot. And I, so Tanya Otiga oh, is with us as well, I think. Um, but uh, looks like she may have dropped off. I think. No, I'm I'm here. Is, Tanya is on. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. We can hear you, Tanya. Perfect. Okay. Great. So feel free to start whenever you are ready. 
Okay, thanks. I'll, I'll start and then I'll, Tanya, I'll lead you in. If you get any trouble, just let me know. Um, so I thanks, everyone. Mm -hmm. I say, thanks. Sorry, Ed. Yes, sorry, Ed. I have media trying to connect. Uh, so she's trying to come in. Uh, this is this is session 11, right? She's just trying to connect just now. One second. Thank you, Ed. I think we can begin, and uh, Media will join shortly. And in the meantime, I'm just I'm just going to go through the slides. Thank you. Okay, thanks. So I'll kick off briefly. Thanks everyone for your attention. Um, there's three of us hopefully presenting today: myself, Ed Llewellyn from Africa Resource Center, ARC, um, uh, Tanya, who's just introduced herself, and Miria, who should join us shortly. Uh, we can go ahead to the next slide, please, Paul. And what we want to cover off today is background rationale to the PSISC, which is a, a public-private uh, partnership that has worked on uh, this topic of um, uh, network optimization in Mozambique. Um, we'll then kind of go to the answer first. We'll share with you the recommended changes um, that the, the project has, has made for Mozambique's network. Uh, and then we'll go into a little bit of detail on the methodology that we followed to get to that and then finish with some next steps. Um, you could go ahead, please, Paul. So Tanya, if you're on and you would like to cover this, please do. Otherwise, I can cover this if we don't have a good connection yes. to you. Thanks. Thanks, Ed. Uh, me Tanya, yeah, I'm here. Please. Yeah, I'm here if you want to. <laughs> please go ahead. Shall I, shall I go ahead? OK, great. Well, uh, hi, everyone. Very nice to meet you. My name is Miria Shabalum. Uh, I'm a senior economist with the World Bank. And previously, I had um, Tanya's role as the focal point for uh, GFF in Mozambique. And uh, together, we have worked on the, the Pisces project in Mozambique. Uh, so GFF uh, started to work in Mozambique in uh, two. 2015, and we developed an investment case at the time, which was a prioritized plan of the, the, the national health strategy. Uh, but this investment case didn't include uh, a component. So I should say that an investment case in, in the world of the GFF and in GFF countries really means to prioritize investments. Um, related to maternal and child health, but it's often also system investments. Uh, and in, in this particular case, the investment case lacked a component on supply chain uh, strengthening. But however, later on, there was a, a disbursement linked indicator that was added, and that was focused on increasing availability of essential drugs uh, at the last mile uh, health facility level. Uh, and in order to achieve this disbursement linked indicator that was tied to financing from the World Bank, from uh, Canada, GFF, USA, there were several partners that uh, were part of the Netherlands that were part of, of, of this program. The government asked um, to support related to outsourcing of, outsourcing of last mile distribution. Uh, and that's how this work came about. And we wanted to do it in a very and in a new way, I would say. So the idea was to use a partnership model that we call PISIS that was formed by uh, Bill and Melinda Gates uh, Foundation, um, Merck for um, uh, M, M for M for M, so it, um, um, Merck for Mothers uh, and the UPS Foundation. Uh, together with the GFF. And the idea was to bring in sort of private sector expertise to support the, the government and, um, and also this was facilitated by ARC, Village Reach and, and Project Last Mile. So we took a, a quite a different approach to, to this technical assistance. We can go to the next slide. 
Um, and um, in general, uh, Mozambique ha has had challenges with drug, drug distribution for, for a very long time. And there was a strategic plan that was developed in 2013. Uh, and this plan, it has very good idea and ideas and concept, but it sort of lacked implementation. So there was um, one challenge was to implement what's called Comando Unico uh, in Portuguese, uh, which is basically that the central medical store, CIMAM, would assume management control over the distribution uh, countrywide, because currently the pro uh, they distribute to the provincial level, but then the provinces are in charge of of uh, the transportation to the district all the way down to the health facilities last mile distribution. Um, and the, the PELC also includes ideas such as reducing the tiers of the supply chain and removing district warehouses uh, in favor of these intermediate warehouses. Uh, there's also uh, this idea of outsourcing distribution and that the state doesn't have to do um, the transportation of the, the essential drugs. So, so lots of very good concepts, but I think the idea, the, the idea with this technical assistance was to work with the government to see how to really implement this and, and, and do that analysis. We can go to the next slide. Um, and here you can see some of the supply chain uh, performance constraints. 45% uh, of health facilities in Mozambique have priority drugs in stock not uh, and not ex expired. There was a survey that found in 2040. 14, 55% uh, of health facilities in Mozambique have priority drugs in stock and not expired. So you see that there's a low sort of availability. Uh, and there's also big issues with warehouse. Uh, yeah, we can go to the next slide. This is for you now, um, Ed. Happy to take over. Yeah, thanks, mate. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so thanks, everyone. Um, I think, um, as I said, we we sort of go straight to the recommendations here, and then sort of work backwards to some of the methodology. Um, Essentially, the network in Mozambique consisted of 162 warehouses currently. That's what you can see on the left-hand side of this slide. Um, and the work that we did um, to find an optimal uh, solution for distribution um, recommended in the end 35 sites. Um, and you can see where those are located um, uh, on the right-hand side of the slide. And you can see some of the impact of the changes that we've modeled. Uh, I should emphasize these are modeled changes. Um, this is part of the advocacy for a change to the network. Um, we are hoping that we'll be able to do some further study, uh, actually longitudinally over several years, to check whether the estimates that we made that result in these recommendations prove, uh, prove out in the long term. Um, but the, the big reduction is obviously uh, around two thirds, we go down to about two thirds of the number of kilometers driven and a, a sort of a, uh, a reduction again of about two thirds on the number of night stops that are required for drivers. And this has a big impact on the costs, which I'll cover in the next slide. So overall, the, the reduction and the simplification of the network results in about 50% savings over 10 years. Um, the annual operating costs go down about 30%, largely driven by the reduction in the kilometers driven. Um, there is an upfront investment required. There would be an upfront investment required in any future case because of the kind of dilapidating warehouses in that 162. Um, but the investment required for the simpler network is, is much less. It's about 60 million versus um, uh, versus uh, about 100 or nearly 200 um, in the alternative case. Um, that 60 million breaks down, as you can see on the left-hand side of the slide. So 40 million is for renovation of warehouses, given the, the sort of the low base of, uh, of the quality of, of some of them. There is 17 million for expansion. That's uh, largely because as you reduce the number of sites in the network, you find that some points have a much greater throughput than they do in the legacy situation. So some of the warehouses need to be expanded. Um, and then there's some uh, investment recommended um, in vehicles. These are for emergency deliveries and supervision 
of the third party logistics outsource partner. Obviously, when you go for an outsource solution, the vast majority of the capital cost of providing the vehicles for the, for the basic distribution is, uh, is with the private sector. And that's one of the advantages um, of the outsourcing concept. Um, overall, uh, just looking at the graph on the right hand side, you can see that um, in blue, we've got the, the capital costs in purple, which is a, a tiny sliver, barely even visible on the right hand side as the vehicle capital costs. And then we looked at the savings in OPEX or recurring operational cost over the 10 years to come up with the conclusion that this network was going to cost roughly 50% of what the, the alternative um, scenario would be. Um, I know we're supposed to, to wait for questions at the end. Um, I'm going to now talk to the methodology of how we got to some of these results. Please move on to the next slide. Thanks. So we, we did the project in two phases. In phase one, we looked at was there an available and willing private sector to take over the distribution and provide this outsourced service to the government? Uh, we found that there was, but one of the concerns was about cash flow uh, within the government. And so it became really important to actually estimate what would be the costs, what would be the budget line item that uh, CIMAM, the relevant uh, institution in Mozambique, would need to get from the national treasury in order to be able to meet their commitments if they signed contracts for distribution. That was um, not immediately transparent because as Miria was saying, the sort of the baseline situation is that most of the distribution is handled by individual provinces. With the evolution and the policy change to centralize management of the end-to-end -end supply chain, we needed to make an estimate of what the budget line item would need to be for SEMA. Um, again, in phase one, so, so that's what we did in phase one. We looked at what the, what the cost would be. One of the findings, um, additional findings in the detail is what's described here on the right hand side. And I know some of the text on the slide is small. The thing I would draw your attention to is that on the left hand side in the blue and green columns is the investment required in each warehouse in order to make the network run. And on the right hand side in the orange is what our modeling estimated the throughput of stock would be at those sites. So the finding is that in several cases, you can see that the investment required in a, net, in a warehouse was much greater than the throughput would really justify. And this was the basis for our second phase of work that looked at uh, optimizing the network and trying to um, balance where the capital would be invested against the throughput of stock at each site. And so you could go to the next slide, please. So the policy that resulted in the, the network we investigated on the last slide was to remove a whole tier of the network at the district level. What we did in phase two was investigate whether such a policy um, was actually going to result in an optimum result. And we investigated a basically a hybrid network structure. So that allowed some, net, some warehouses at the district level to be retained in the future in the future organization, especially where they were very close to sources of demand. Um, we also looked at what the impact would be of having some warehouses operate as cross docks. And I've got a slide on that later if anyone uh, would like greater explanation of a cross dock concept. In a nutshell, it basically means you don't hold stock at the, at the location. You just have a truck come in with stock and then you have several smaller vehicles then immediately distribute that stock to the health facility. And we also looked at whether changing inventory policy was going to have an impact on the necessary size of warehouses and the capex as a result. Um, our method basically looked to reduce drive time, uh, distance and warehouse opex, which was uh, calculated as a, as a function of that throughput that I talked about on the last slide. We also added up the capex that was going to be required. We estimated management costs for CMAM themselves, but also for the outsourcing partners, given that they would have to pass that cost on to the government. We did force the modeling to adopt sites that had been upgraded within the last few years, because those represented a sunk cost and there was no point in removing those. Um, and then we gave the optimizer the opportunity to pick a site that was an existing Ministry of Health uh, owned location, even if it was, as I said, a, a district or even if it was, as I said, a, a, another health facility as a place where it would make sense to invest in warehousing 
capacity um, if the model felt it made sense. Um, key findings were cross stocks, this concept of having sites that don't store stock, but allow you to break bulk from larger inbound vehicles to smaller ones made a significant difference on the CapEx. The best network did use the opportunity to leverage some district sites, which would have been removed in the earlier policy. Um, and the overall investment case was, was as I was describing on a previous slide. Um, I mentioned that we looked at inventory. We found that inventory policy was much less of a determinant of the overall costs once you adopted this hybrid um, network and once you allowed cross docks than we had thought. And so in the end, we didn't end up modeling lots of different scenarios for varying levels of inventory. We just found that it wasn't as big a determinant on the eventual costs as we might have imagined previously. Thanks, uh, you could move on to the next slide, please. So I think I'll, I'll try and hand back to Tanya or Miria if either of you got the connection to cover next steps, thanks. Thank you, Ed. I think I think it's it's my turn. <laughs> so um, the recommended next steps um, on the side of Simam and Misao and on the side of development partners, we we do believe, like Ed was talking now, is that the recommended network can really achieve significant performance improvements, and there is a robust investment case to prove it, as he was showing through the numbers, the figures, and through that hybrid model that was uh, devised based on the resources available. But of course, there's gonna be some changes that need to happen. First, at the government level, um, there needs to be policy changes uh, to give them end-to-end -end visibility and control. So on the side of the government, uh, both on the Central de Medicamentos and the Ministry of Health, so MESAL, uh, they need to formally adopt the recommended network and advocate for policy changes as well as budget. Uh, there's also a need to develop the lead. They need to lead the develop, uh, development of multi-year warehouse renovation and building plan, invest in skills to contract, manage uh, uh, the outsourced transportation network, and invest in skills for supply chain planning that will enable the use of cross-stock warehousing uh, sites. On the side of the development partners, we need to continue supporting advocacy for policy change, but also adapting the existing supply chain investments to the new network and the, the structure that has been recommended in this report. Um, a very important aspect of this is to align future investments to this multi-year warehouse renovation and building plan, but also to support capacity development and uh, IT enablers for contract management and supply, uh, and supply chain uh, planning. Next slides, please. Um, I, I, I want to add just a small note on updating this information. If you can move backwards to the, the previous slide. Thank you. Um, we have made already some progress on this. Uh, there's been a change in management in CMAM that just happened a few weeks ago. And the new management has not formally, but informally adopted these recommendations in this plan. And we are just waiting for the Minister of Health to approve it formally. The construction of warehouses is underway and partners are actually rallying around this plan. And we're going to be working, the GFF is going to be working alongside other partners to map existing uh, activities, resources and partners to make sure that we have a clear roadmap on what the next steps need to be. Um, thank you very much, Media. I don't know if you would like to uh, close. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think what we'll do is I will uh, end the show. Maybe you can still see my screen with it. Um, and we can turn it over. Can you still see my screen, the PowerPoint presentation? Yeah, can see can. Perfect. All right. So maybe we've got seven, three minutes here. So why don't we turn it over for Q&A? Um, and I will let um, anyone who feel free just to come off a of mute and uh, um, ask your question away. And, and Paul, I think there's one question in the chat from Ali that I can read out here. Perfect. Um, which other development partners are you working with to realize this plan? How have the initial reactions been from CMAM? Anya, do you want to take that one? Um, I know um, you were giving kind of the I, 
I can come in quickly just to say that, so Mozambique is one of those countries, as I'm sure many of you know, who has worked there, that there are lots of partners involved in, in the country. So I would say that there are different partners involved in different processes. Um, as I mentioned, there is this disbursement linked indicator uh, that has one partnership behind it, which is like, uh, well, now I think USAID has dropped out, but it used to be USAID, DFID, Netherlands, uh, Canada, um, GFF, World Bank. I think those are the seven partners, right? Am I missing anyone, Tanya? No? <laughs> uh, and then this partnership that did sort of the technical assistance is more technical partners that have worked on supply chain, but also uh, so ART, and Merck for Mothers, uh, UPS Foundation, um, um, yeah, and I'm missing some ad. You can talk to this partnership, World Bank, GFF, etc. So it's been sort of the uh, um, uh, last mile Coca-Cola, uh, Village Reach. So you can hear that there are lots of sort of more technical supply chain partners supported by the GFF um, and, and Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And then I think the, the other piece is the partners that we are now sort of rallying to buy into this investment case. And that's, uh, you know, USAID, Gavi, Global Fund, the, the usual suspects, right? <laughs> uh, so, so I would say that there are different, many different partners involved. Um, I'm sure I forgot some, so, you know, don't feel offended. Uh, it's, it's not on purpose. And then I think the, in terms of reactions from CMAM, I just want to mention that uh, CIMAM has been very involved throughout in this work. And I think that has been crucial for the, um, the sort of reception of CIMAM. We had uh, one person in CIMAM that was the focal point for the work. There was also a consultant that they trust very, um, uh, very much that was uh, sort of very deeply involved in this work. Uh, so, I think the reception overall has been quite uh, good because they have been uh, involved throughout. So it's not like a consulting group was doing the work. It's like we were working for Simam to do the work. It was requested by them and, and they have been following the process very closely. But maybe Ed and Tanya wants to come in on, on, on this as well, but that's uh, my, my two piece of answers. Uh, nothing to add from me, just to say that, yes, USAID is the partner that is already working on reconstruction of warehouses, and they've changed recently from working only with Village Reach. They have uh, split the contract into two, and now they have Village, Village Reach, and I, I, I don't know if that I'm going to pronounce this name right. I think it's Bolore, um, who is going to be working on the, on the last mile distribution. Um, and yes, and, and yes, the feedback from Simam has been... Wonderful, thank you, Ed. Um, the, the, the feedback from CMAM has been very, very positive. As media said, this wasn't pushed. This was absolutely demand-driven. Thank you. Awesome. Ed, Thanks, any everyone. last thoughts to add before we transition? I was gonna say, I think we're out of time and I think we, we covered it. So thanks for everyone's attention. Um, yeah, if there's any technical questions, you could reach out to me uh, separately after this. I'd be happy to answer those. Thanks. Awesome. Ed, do you mind putting your contact information in the chat in case there are any follow-up questions? Great. All right. Well, thank you very much for presenting. Um, and we, we really enjoyed having you here. I will transition us over to our next presentation. Uh, so we will be hearing from a team presenting on alternative drug distribution points to address barriers to accessing antiretroviral anti treatment in Uganda. And so I am sharing um, my screen now. Oops, let me make sure I have my sound shared one moment. Yes. All right, and I will be starting the presentation. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening everywhere you are in the world. I'm called Eduard Kato from Ministry of Health, Uganda. 
and I'll be taking you through this presentation with my other colleague Paul on the alternative drug distribution points on addressing uh, barriers to accessing antiretroviral treatment in Uganda. Um, we work with other colleagues uh, from Africa Resource Center, Kevin and Lebo, who provide TA to Ministry of Health in DSDM. Uh, this is the outline of our presentation. It has a background, uh, ADDP approaches, data visualization and coordination, and the next steps. Uh, <clears throat> in terms of uh, PHIVs in Uganda, we have a total of an approximation of 1.5 million people living with HIV, and out of those, 1.3 million people are on ARRT. Prevalence among adults 15 to 49 is at 5.8. New infections stand at 53,000, and age related deaths stand at 21,000. 85% of the adults are on ART treatment, and 65% of children are on ART. PLHIV received treatment in different differentiated service delivery models, and approximately we have around 1,400 ART clinics across the country. Um, <clears throat> our, our DSD is based on two principles client centered care and improved health care system if, and improved health system efficiency, with four building blocks uh, the, when the client is at the center. The building blocks include the when, where, the who, and what. These are the five DSD approaches we currently operate in Uganda. Two are the more intensive models, facility-based individual management and the facility-based groups. And the three are the less intensive models, fast track drug refill and community client led up delivery and community drug distribution points. And Ministry of Health is moving, uh, pushing to ensure that uh, more clients are on the less intensive model. This is how we stand in terms of clients in care per DSD. We have 735,000 on stable approaches or the less intensive and 513,000 on the more intensive models. And we have a uh, majority of the clients on fast track drug refill and FBIM why we have very few clients on the, around 11% of the clients on the community approaches. 84% of the recipients of care receive treatment at health facilities. Um, enrollment in the community models, the, that's the CDDP and CLAD has stagnated. Uh, when you look at this slide from 2020 to date, we have only 5.9% client, clients on the CLAD group and 5.5 um, on CDDP. This is the supply chain, the how products flow through a number of channels to reach the recipients of care. We have different funding sources from Government of Uganda, Global Fund, USAID, and CDC. For Global Fund and Government of Uganda, they flow through the national medical stores, the public health facilities, while for USAID and CDC, they flow through the joint medical stores and medical access Uganda to, flow, uh, to move to the private not for profit facilities. This is a supply chain model in Uganda where Ministry of Health is in charge of quantification and coordination of the supply chain processes. While NMS receives stores and distributes commodities to the public health facilities, and the health facilities receive process accountability and issue drugs to the recipients of care in the community through the CLAD groups and the CDDPs. Um, we have 7,277 facilities, and 100 out of that, 118 pharmacies surveyed and mapped as analysis for reality. 14% of PLHIVs live more than five kilometers from an art facility and need a different solution. Nationally, it's estimated that 196,000 recipients of care that live further than five kilometers from art accredited site. This distance was calculated using road network distances rather than straight line distances for more accurate results. This, is, this exercise is applicable even in areas that seem to have high number of ART facilities. Thank you so much. My colleague will come in to take you through the ADDP approaches. Thank you, Edward. And 
Um, so we'll start off with the objectives we defined for looking at alternative models, uh, decongest facilities and increase ease of access and care for stable art recipients of care, address the root cause of poor retention, of which some were distance to facilities and lack of transport, and provide client-centered care. Short waiting time, non-stigmatizing, flexible hours, for example, early morning or late evening or over weekends. Two approaches were, take, were, were chosen to address objectives. The first one is the Community Retail Pharmacy Drug Distribution Point, or CRPDDP. And the summary of that is that art recipients of care pick up medicine at a private pharmacy. Second is the location, urban and peri-urban health facilities with over 2,000 art recipients of care. The second model is the community-led drug distribution point, of which it can be summarized as an integrated approach that is overseen by the local community associations that conduct community wealth pooling, and the location is communities over five kilometers from the nearest art pickup point. The CRPVD, CRPDDP decongests health facilities. The CRPDDP approach is an approach that allows recipients of care to collect their medicines at a nearby isolated local pharmacy in their community. The target is stable PLHIV who work or live in urban settings, outsourcing to private sector pharmacies, handling of government medicines, uh, fee paid to pharmacists for dispensing. The CRDDP, CRPDDP requires all stakeholders to work together. And these stakeholders include the district local government with support from the IP, is the facility, and is the supply chain. The CRPDDP community flow ex uses existing supply chain. So from the central warehouse, where everything starts from, it then goes to the facility and from the facility to the pharmacy. And a facility can 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 service more than one pharmacy at a time. The CRP DDP has benefits for multiple stakeholders. For the recipients of care, there's improved accessibility and convenience of receiving ARTs. There's decreased costs, travel, distances, and time taken to receive ART. There's decreased stigmatization associated with receiving art improved adherence, retention, and suppression rates, reduced time spent at health facilities, which helps with decreased risk of infections from other patients, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic. For the health facilities, it's reduced operational costs, and it has been shown that there's a 10% reduction cost, reduced congestion at health facilities, and improved efficiencies and increased capacity with limited investment. For the health system, it could decongest over 600,000 stable recipients of care from the health facility and can add an additional 450,000 nurse working hours per annum. The extended pilot in progress to test model across Uganda. We're looking at 16 implementing partners, 32 districts, 64 health facilities, 109 pharmacies, and an estimated 300,000 recipients of care. And what you see in the, on the map is the distribution of the districts um, where uh, this pilot is going to take place. The implementation of the pharmacy model is underway. And um, you know, progress is monitored by an electronic tracker to coordinate and provide visibility of process to all stakeholders. And there's a progress submission and updates that is done electronically and in real time. For the community-led drug distribution point, clients in remote areas um, at, and improves access to livelihoods. A community-led drug distribution point is a service approach in which healthcare workers provide integrated health services, including art, HIV, counseling and testing, TB services, and other primary healthcare services in a community, and the community plays a role in mobilization oversight. 
The target is stable people living with HIV and other recipients of care who live over five kilometers from the nearest health facility. And this is based on a pilot which has run since August 2015 by Health Access Connect in over 60 remote communities across over seven districts. The CLDDB pilot has served many recipients of care needs in remote areas and shows and has shown um, resilience. Total integrated patient services in pilot between August 2015 and, and 2021, all services provided by government health workers and remote communities and service delivery continued throughout the lockdowns during a pandemic. Uh, testimonies, uh, testimonials from, um, a CLDD, from the CLDDP recipients of care. Um, we've got one from I Isaac Sengova, um, who has talked about the uh, reduction in stigma as a result of um, the CLDDP, uh, because they see other others getting tested, talking with healthcare workers and getting our drugs. They also feel less fear and do the same. We've got a, a testimonial from the community health workers where they say they're looking at, they see now seeing big numbers coming in compared to what had been done previously. CLDDP approach integrates services and stakeholder involvement. Um, the more services are integrated, the greater the benefit to the community. The stakeholders are the local community association, which is a local volunteer led organization. There's the LCA, which oversees the CLDDP outreaches, mobilizes ROC and works with health workers to improve service delivery. The CLDDP expenses are funded through existing funding streams, including government of Uganda, PEPFA, results-based financing and other donors. And below is the, again, targeted and um, um, IPs and districts, and that is their distribution. Just like with the pharmacy, we have um, uh, trackers that have been uh, put in place that then track the implementation and progress to that. And this can, this can reach an estimated 14,000 recipients of care in the communities. So we look at data visualization and coordination. Many, services, many service providers Many service providers without alignment on data and targets, stakeholders have to use labor intensive processes of downloading data and analyzing in Excel, difficult to explore and share analysis, time spent compiling data rather than asking questions. ARC and, and uh, Ministry of Health and, and ARC uh, drafted dashboards to address the gaps in data alignment, identified a tool that ACP can take over without continuous support, and there is a drill down capability to lowest level data collected. Training, implementation, and coordination materials are shared in DSD, Uganda website, DSD related documents, ADDP weekly update form, the CRP DDP tracker, the CLDDP um, tracker, so there was a repetition, and the DSD dashboard. Next steps, enroll and sub recipients of care, report and monitor progress, build on extended pilots, undertake implementation science research to get understanding of progress of approaches and changes that should be made. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and I know we have some presenters on the line today. Um, would you like to start off with any overall comments to add to the presentation? Hi, um, no, thank you. I, I think my colleagues have covered it very well and happy to take some questions uh, from the uh, members around the, the model or any other questions that they might have. There's a couple of questions on the chat group that I think uh, yep, we do. Um, Ed would be best suited to answer. Yeah, and feel free if you want to come over, come off of mute to ask your question. Um, otherwise, I can I can certainly read it. I think we've got Herbert here. Herbert, are you still here? 
I'll, I'll go ahead and read the question here. What could be the reasons why the community models are not growing as expected? What is the ministries of health? What is the Ministry of Health doing to fast track this growth? Okay, hi everyone. This is Edward Kato from Ministry of Health. Um, the number. Uh, how about thank you for the question. The number of uh, reasons why uh, the community models are not growing, but most of them are surrounding uh, stigma uh, because uh, most of our people living with HIV are women in care and we live in a patriarchal society. So they are stigmatized in the communities where they are. So you cannot uh, serve ARVs in a community of uh, people who are not HIV positive and everyone will pinpoint them as HIV positive. So one of the things we are doing to increase the number of clients on the community models is implementation of the alternative drug distribution points uh, the pharmacy uh, model. Thank you, and over. My colleagues can add on. Thanks, Edward. I think you've answered it. All right, we've got one more question here. Um, CLL, CLLDP is part of a plan of community model growth. Okay, I see, I see that. So that was more of a question more than anything. Never mind. Let, let me open it up to the floor again and see if there's any other questions that we have here. Um, maybe someone was stirred by Herbert's question. And thank you for the answer uh, to that question as well. I had one question um, surrounding the selection of the community pilots and then the pharmacy pilots. Were there areas where there were both models in place, both the pharmacy and the community, or were you all pretty selective in making sure that uh, they were kind of split up to cover different geographies? Um, I can answer the question around pharmacy, which is mostly urban. And obviously, there would be areas where there will not be pharmacies, and those would be mostly be covered by the uh, by the community model. But even in the areas where there are pharmacies, where there are not uh, enough service for more, for where people live more than five kilometers away, uh, in that district you could have both. But but it's it's essentially almost split between a pharmacy, a, a rural, and an urban model. I hope that answers the question. Yeah. So I'll just, I'll just add a bit to that. So it's, it's quite interesting because what happens in Uganda, just geographically, um, pharmacies are centered in urban. So you will not find, in, you will not find in, in, a pharmacy in the rural. And that's why the models that were developed were to, were to serve um, the urban and those that are out of the urban, basically five kilometers away um, from the nearest health facility. And that's just the way it was designed based on the GIS data. Got it, that was very helpful, thank you. All right, and we have another question in the chat from the poll. Um, I can read it out loud. So social determinants of health have had a huge impact on health systems. Are you working with other ministries to improve service delivery through ADD? All right, let me say something. Um, we work with uh, the line ministries like Ministry of Education and Sports uh, in Uganda and Ministry of Gender, Labor and Social Development. Ministry of Gender, is in charge of providing social protection services and economic strengthening. So we ensure that we link our clients on social protection uh, uh, as well as social uh, economic services so that they can, uh, we, at the end of the day, our clients are able to get a continuum of response. 
to 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 be retained in care over Lebeau, did you have anything to add or Paul to that response? Nothing from Not me. from my side. Great. Go ahead. I think we had we had someone speaking as well. Repeat that last comment. So I think that was me. It was saying nothing from my side. Nothing from your side? Okay. I thought, okay, perfect. Well, I think we've got two more minutes here. Maybe we just give sort of uh, color on what the next steps are here, Sydney. Um, so I'm sure you all know we've got a 10 minute break after 1225, followed by your next um, uh, session, which is at 1235. Uh, there will be uh, the prize winner announcements as well as other announcements and Dr. Uh, Ravi will be providing closing remarks um, as well as a follow um, followed by another opportunity to network as well. Uh, so first and foremost, we'd like to thank you all for joining our track, our session, and, and this was really insightful uh, to hear about the amazing work uh, that's really happening within this uh, segment of supply chain, because it's very, very critical. Um, uh, without the supply chain, there isn't uh, much efficacy in what we do. And so really appreciate uh, not just your thoughtfulness, but also the time you've taken to, to share your insight, your knowledge, your time, um, allowing us to ask questions, allowing others to learn. And, and uh, we really look forward to hearing more about what you all do uh, going forward and to come back and to speak with us again uh, so we can keep up to date with it. And so thank you. And uh, with that, I will uh, be ending the session unless there's any last uh, words that anyone would like to share uh, with the rest of the group. Thank you, Craig. All right. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate the time. Take care, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye.